Welcome to Dr. James Cousins' lecture series on Southern Alberta history recorded in 1974. Today, Talk 8 is about liquor sales in the 1880s and 90s. Everyone knows then that the illicit liquor trade stopped with the coming of the Mounted Police, except the residents of Southern Alberta. Well then, why did the McLaughers at state? You may think that the cow business is our chief industry, but it is not. It is the whiskey trade, and this a prohibition country, too. March the 13th, 1886, McLeod Gazette. So let's back up a little and find that there are two forces fighting each other in North America. One was the heavy drinking Western tradition whose patron saint could easily have been Prime Minister John A. Macdonald. And the teetotalers, the down with the demon rum movement of which Prime Minister Alexander Mackenzie could have been our shining light. You know, it's, it's amazing what these young typists don't know. This girl has WCIU. <laughs> my, my. Carrie Nation will turn over in her grave. Or she'll bash her coffin with her axe. The WCTU and Carrie Nation in North America and the Band of Hope and Signing of the Pledge in Britain were merely outriders of a strange movement that was best expressed by the populists and the progressives in the United States uh, that considered that morality can be legislated. And if you follow through, uh, you'll find that anything that was wrong in those days, you just passed another law. If there's anything wrong with uh, corporations, you pass a law about corporations. If there's anything wrong with monopoly, pass another law. If there's anything wrong with drinking, pass a law. Anything wrong with smoking, pass another law. There's a lawyer's idea of heaven. You see, all illnesses, all illnesses are caused by sin. That sounds like Christian science. Uh, but, um, all evils are caused by bad laws, according to lawyers. And this is, you know, this is in history books, especially those that have a legalistic turn. And therefore, all evils can be remedied by changing the law. Take out one law, put in another law. Well, I can remember singing with a lot of these people. Um, it's time we went to Parliament to stop the drinking trade, to stop the drinking, stop the drinking, stop the drinking trade, and so on ad infinitum. Uh, I don't know if they still sing that in, in Britain now or not, but I used to be a member of the Band of Hope when I was small, and I went back to Britain in 1967, about 50 years after, and found that instead of there being a band, I was a solo instrument all by myself. <laughs> all the rest of them were guzzling beer at some pub or other. Well, so the greatest victory of the populists and the progressives was the prohibition laws that came during World War I and shortly afterwards. Well, it seemed that in the 80s and 90s, the Southern Alberta nonconformist ministers were the vanguard of the temperance movement. And the strange thing was, they didn't mean temperance, they meant abstinence. Uh, temperance, uh, by any definition, means moderate. But they didn't mean believe in moderate drinking, they believed in no drinking at all. It was a very strong movement. Uh, the newspapers, to a man, gave lip service to temperance, but Really, they were the fellows who went out and bought Brand X after all the advertising was done. They always uh, claimed that drinking was bad and uh, the results of drink were evil, but somehow or other, they all seemed to get something to drink. Uh, because of the overwhelming strength of the missionaries in the West and because of the obvious need to save the native population from debauchery, the federal government was able to impose a prohibition law upon the West which kept even the white population from purchasing liquor, except for medicinal purposes uh, for which a permit was issued. So this is the famous permit system. Fortunately, the West was sufficiently unhealthy to prevent the, either the police or the citizens from drying out completely. Now, Mr. C.A. McGrath kept one of these permits, and it exists in his file in the National Archives in Ottawa, so I took it out and I copied it down. And it's dated November 26, 1885, and it's worded thus, you know, so-and-so shall take, and then I have in quotation marks, within, and then there's a little space, and somebody's written in one month, months, from date, and square brackets, C.A. McGrath is permitted to take into the Northwest Territories two gallons of whiskey, two gallons of wine, and to have, and to have at any time thereafter in his possession for domestic purposes. And but you notice that he's given permission on that date to bring liquor in. And from that time on, he can have liquor to the amount of 
two gallons of whiskey and two gallons of wine on that permit. So he can drink it all up and he can get another couple, and as long as that's all he's got, he's covered. The permit has no def definite period of ex extermination. It doesn't expire at any time. And the mounted police, so they, they, they run frantic over this. Uh, the last sentence, because no time limit was given then, would entitle Mr. McGrath to have two gallons of whiskey and two gallons of wine in his position, in his possession any time after that date. Now this was a thorn in the side of the police, who, whenever they tried to arrest bootleggers, found that in 90% of the cases, the culprit nearly always had a dog-eared permit for exactly the amount he was carrying. So he'd go, take it in, sell it, go back, get another load, exactly what the permit said. So I tried to give some sort of picture of the ramifications of the foregoing as the news stories portrayed them. Now, in spite of the restrictions, there were a number of saloons in town. Now, you'd wonder why there would be a saloon in town when all they could sell was hop beer, uh, which uh, was not malt beer. In other words, it was supposed to be non-alcoholic. And uh, it was so low in alcoholic content that it was classed as a non-alcoholic beverage. Malt beer was forbidden, and yet Lethbridge had two breweries. Now, what really happened, of course, is revealed by an item such as this in the very first issue of the News in December 1885. H.J. Little of the Palace Saloon was arrested for having whiskey illegally in his possession. Mr. Little was tried in McLeod and fined. He didn't have a magistrate, a J.P. here in Lethbridge at that time. Uh, there are many arrests, of course, on charges of selling liquor to the Indians, showing that the Gazette's statements about which was the chief injury were not, industry were not too far off the mark. Here's one. Adolf Sear was fined $300 plus $44 costs for selling liquors to, liquor to India. That's the Gazette on the 28th of November, 1885. The very first issue of the news advertises Alberta Brewery, Noel and St. Goddard Props. So the brewery started with the town, the very first issue of the paper. Now, apparently, the liquor trade from Montana had not stopped either, as Superintendent Neal was quoted in 1885 as saying, our mission is to assist in the suppression of the Montana whiskey traffic. And I've got a footnote here. The editor was all mixed up on how to spell whiskey. And uh, uh, the Scots, of course, who invented it, spell it this way. And the Americans who drink it spell it this way. And the whiskey should be spelled with a Y, no E in there. And any Scot will tell you that's the way it's spelled. Generally in Canada, we spell whiskey that way, whiskey and whiskey, the Americans spell it that way. The effects are the same. <laughs> and the only trouble was the editors of the newspapers could never remember how to spell it. So you could have in the same paragraph that whiskey spelled two different ways. Fortunately, there aren't three ways of spelling it other than they've had that too. Probably they had a drink of said whiskey before they started writing the paragraph. Well, um, our mission then is to assist in the suppression of the Montana whiskey traffic. It is reported that a great deal is sold to the Indians. Even the heavy fines, now $300 in those days was a lot. Even a top coal miner, uh, a digger, a collier as they called them then, uh, only got $250 a day. So a $300 fine with $44 cost was quite a chunk of money. Apparently it didn't bother these bootleggers because they seemed to turn up from time to time again as soon as they recouped, I suppose. They were only caught about one time in ten, I imagine. Well, the ministers, of course, entered the game quite soon in opposition to this liquor trade. And although the Methodist Church was the last one to be built, the Reverend Alfred Andrews held services in Lethbridge Hall, Hall the first church actually to hold services in Lethbridge, was the Methodist. Now, he was the most intransigent opponent of the liquor trade, uh, but not any more so than the Reverend Charles McKillop, who came along a little bit later. However, there was something about Mr. Andrews that antagonized people, whereas Charles McKillop didn't. People could disagree with McKillop, but be positively insulting to Mr. Andrews. Now, Mr. Andrews was the man who had volunteered to be the school teacher uh, in Lethbridge when they tried to start a school before they formed the school district. Well, as early as March um, of 1886, the preachers got together to organize their temperance work, get a committee going to dry up this area. Now, you uh, may not be aware of it, but I'm a teetotaler and have been all my life. Just, uh, uh, but I still like to sing drinking songs. You know, being a Welshman, a good song is a good song, and I don't care if it, it sounds alcoholic right down to the elbows. Uh, 
this is uh, my own personal choice, not anybody else. Um, so that uh, the very first letter that appeared in the Lethbridge News after it came out was from the same Reverend Mr. Andrews deploring the profaning of the Lord's Day by running wagons, especially the water wagons, on the Sabbath. And Mr. James Savage replied and stating that the water barrels were not big enough to hold water for two days and suggested that Mr. Andrews would be better occupied if he watched the traffic that went on foot in coal oil pans, uh, referring, of course, to the alcoholic distribution network of southern Alberta. Uh, now, that the people were tired of the situation is shown by an item stating that the citizens of McLeod were getting up a brief supporting the abolition of the uh, permit system, excepting Indians, of course. We've got to protect those Indians. Uh, and now, regarding these same Indians, they apparently congregated at the river bottom, so that when we see this item, a cache of 25 gallons of whiskey was seized by the police on the river bottom near the sawmill. This is August 1886. Jeff Talbot and Owen Gagnon were arrested. I don't know what that fellow's doing with a Welsh first name and a, and a French second name. Uh, some miscegenation there somewhere. Well, uh, they were arrested and they were fined. I think they were only fined $200. Uh, maybe because they had to take the stage up to McLeod or something, they got out cheaper. Well, in November, somebody in the Northwest Territories Council suggested that instead of relaxing the permit system, the council should tighten it. This sent our editor into a paroxysm. The federal law of the last 12 years says he has been obnoxious. Mr. Saunders felt that the old protect the Indian idea was no not valid anymore. Fortunately, says Mr. Saunders, our member, our local member, that was Mr. Haltain, consigned this unreasonable and unwarrantable motion to the limbo of a six months hoist. So he got the thing tabled and that was the end of that. My, it's bad enough now uh, rather than tightening it up. But apparently there were a lot of clergy uh, tied up in that uh, Northwest Territories Council, and they were able to make their weight felt. In the meantime, Mr. Roy and Mr. Noel in the brewery circulated a petition which they intended to circulate in Calgary, McLeod, and Edmonton to get federal permission to brew beer, ale, and porter. That's the last I ever heard of the petition. I don't know where it got to. Not, uh, nothing came of it anyway. Now, uh, following is an interesting item. A man named Addis Adamson had his horse and buggy and 35 gallons of whiskey seized by the police. And the editor launched a bitter attack on the liquor system. Said he, less than 5% of the liquor consumed here comes from the permits. Most of it comes from Montana. Well, then what was he worrying about the permit system for? It's all coming in from Montana anyway. He also mentioned that the police had seized another 35 gallons of whiskey at a freight shed and uh, they saw it in the freight shed. It had come in by train, consigned without a name. And the man didn't call for it. They, they had a stake out there for two days, and nobody came to pick it up, I guess. The stake out was too obvious, so they, uh, uh, he didn't call for his whiskey, and so the police seized it. And I, I'm not sure whether this is the one or not, but one consignment, they took it home to the inspector's house and put it in the basement. And when they went to collect it up, uh, for evidence, there was only 15 gallons left. <laughs> now, we wouldn't think of accusing any of the police from drinking any, for drinking any of that, but somebody end, ended up with 20 more gallons of whiskey than he started with. I guess he figured that it was cluttering up the basement a little. Well, both the press and the clergy agreed on the evil, but not on the ways to combat it. Uh, said the editor, Mr. Bess, now this is another preacher, would doubtless be glad to see the whole population of the Northwest controlled by a few fanatical followers of temperance and inflict the se severest penalties on those who ventured to oppose their decrees. Apparently, Mr. Betts was another Mr. Andrews who was uh, talking about sin. By November, the editor blew up completely, for the government decided to close all breweries, even those which made only hot beer, uh, which, he says, in any case, it is not an intoxicant. And then this funny little, uh, little phrase comes in. And although there is little doubt that some of those engaged in the manufacture have transgressed the law by tempering it with alcohol, uh, I mean, not our view, but some of those dirty guys say in Calgary might have been doing this sort of thing, this is no justification for interfering with the industry itself. You see, you shouldn't close down the 
Uh, that, probably that's the reason why it was that non-alcoholic beers may, beer made our Indians so drunk. Uh, there must be a, a reason other than the tendency uh, of smelling a cork and getting drunk on that basis. Well, the editor continued the attack by showing how many men will be put out of work if they close these breweries. This is a backward step, he thought, considering that there is a movement afoot to manufacture good malt beer here. He said, why don't they have inspectors all over the country the way we have in McLeod and Lethbridge here? I don't know what the inspectors are inspecting. Uh, there is no law against hot beer and other temperance beverages. And if they close down these breweries, it will only increase the smuggling. Well, another thorn in the flesh of our people here was copied from the Calgary Herald. The government decided that nobody could make malt beer in the Northwest Territories, but it could be imported. It started with the CPR. The CPR were allowed to serve this on their trains. And uh, the result was that uh, the, the beer could come in from outside, but they couldn't make it here. So you could buy beer from Winnipeg, but you couldn't buy Lethbridge or Calgary beer because they weren't allowed to make it. This is rather odd. And even the populace got a little disgruntled. A fellow who signed his name Ox Spina wrote a letter denouncing preachers, mentioning Mr. Andrews by name, and other cranks, he said, who are pillows of the church. <laughs> a, little, a little mixed up there, but... Uh, <laughs> and these pillows of the church are distorting the facts about alcohol. In the meantime, the police kept merrily raiding the saloon, sometimes with success, or as in March the 22nd, 1888, successfully when they raided the Nickel Plate Saloon here in Lethbridge, and the owner was fined $134.75. Now, an example of the attitude towards Mr. Andrews is shown in a little article that published, that published about the same time. The article announced that Mr. Andrews was coming to preach, but not to renew his old occupation. In other words, he wasn't going to preach about uh, temper. So this is what Mr. Saunders does. He composes a little doggerel and sticks it at the top of the paragraph and says, Blow the bugles, sound the drums, lo, the Reverend Andrews comes. <laughs> he must have had... Uh, and he further warned unruly parties not to ask silly questions like, What is the price of pork? And he particularly warned the people of Pincher Creek not to jingle their money in their pockets in case they came. Pincher Creek must be notorious for having a lot of small change. Well, even Commissioner Herkmer was ready to give up. His report, which was quoted in the news, said that enforcement is becoming more difficult because respectable people who otherwise are honest will resort to every device to evade the liquor laws. Many people carry permits with them at all times in case they are caught. The permit system is bad and should be replaced by a law that can be enforced, said the commissioner. He said that liquor came in in barrels of sugar or salt or came in as ginger ale, and even as neatly constructed eggs. <laughs> uh, Herkmer even went so far as to suggest that the importation of lager beer should be permitted, and he said this would remove some of the opprobrium uh, of, from his men. Well, the editor then pointed out, in an editorial called Legal Ter Terrorism, that there is a danger under the present system that a perjurer may convict an innocent man by his evidence alone, and then receive half the fine as a reward. And this was being done. Even with breweries ostensibly closed, Mr. W. D. Mackenzie sold one brewery and then proceeded to build another one on Baroness Street. Then in June, only half in jest, the editor scoffed at the Ottawa Mountain, laboring and producing only a most. Because while they had set out to form a detective <coughs> police force, they ended up by settling for a small group of whiskey informers. Said the editor, and is there any moral good in sending among us servants of the law whose business it is to spurn truth and honor aside? The language was still a little 19th century. Now an interesting legal question arose when Mr. Ford's Calgary to McLeod stage was stopped and searched by the police. A parcel of liquor was found which the coach driver, Mr. Braden, claimed was express. Now, this is 1889 now. He claimed that he didn't know what was in the parcel. He said he was just carrying express. Well, he was fined $100, and the team and coach were confiscated. Well, Mr. Stedman at the livery stable wouldn't surrender the team because he said his bill hadn't be paid, been paid, so the police took them anyway, and so the whole thing landed up in court. 
And Justice James McLeod quashed the conviction and said that the stage company is not responsible for the carrying of liquor. It's the person who sends it or the person who receives it, but not the carrier. And uh, th this is the sort of uh, judgments that McLeod made. They were very uh, much easier than you'd expect from such a stern-mounted policeman as, as he was. Well, the most unkindest cut of all, if I may quote Shakespeare, came on April 1889, when Mr. A.K. Barrett, the Inspector of Internal Revenue, informed the breweries that they will have to discontinue the manufacture of all kinds of beverages from now on. This made the, the editor hopping mad because he discovered that 4% hop beer could be imported and not manufactured. And Mr. McKenzie then, with his new brewery, added two stories and turned it into a hotel. <laughs> Couldn't even make, make pop anymore. Well, the results were not devastating to drinkers, for the police held a symposium in which they damned the permit system. Superintendent Dean of Lethbridge stated succinctly, bootlegging is stopped, the hop beer breweries are closed, but a permit is a permit and Lethbridge is still wet. <laughs> so there it is. Um, the police were then reduced to a periodic raiding of saloons to try to keep the trade from becoming too blatant. And at this time, in 1890, a new column appeared. I think this was the time when, when Saunders gave up as being editor and became managing director, and a fellow named Potts was editor for about three months. And when, the, when, this, uh, uh, when this thing came out, uh, it was uh, Mr. A.S. Potts. But uh, he was kicked out a little later because he wrote a scathing article on um, Mr. Davin of Regina. He said, we can't put up with that sort of insulting stuff, so he fired him. The interesting thing was his own editorials on Nicholas Flood Davin were horrible. I've got copies of them, and someday when I finish writing all this stuff, I put in what he called Davin with his two-a-penny uh, newspaper, <laughs> Regina Leader, and so on. But uh, so that I imagine that Saunders was the fellow who wrote this column called Ronda. And uh, in Ronda's column in August 1890, he attacked the W.S. Now, the W.S. in brackets he called the Whiskey Sneaks. He said they had, he had been told that Charles McKillop supported this action. So he asked Charles McKillop, and Charles McKillop denied it. These fellows going around trying to make people sell liquor to them and then arresting them. Remember the, the, the case I told you about in McCloud? <laughs> he he got liquor from everybody in town and sued the whole bunch and then ducked off into the United States. Well, he was one of these. Well, uh, at the same time, Roundup condemned the held ends and joints where illegal liquor was sold. As a result, Mr. McKillop advertised a plain speaking sermon on temperance. And then this thing was copied in the press in full, so you could read the whole thing if you were interested. He stated then that there were 50 places last year where drink could be bought. Other men went out and counted and showed that there were only 35 now. But as Mr. McKillop knew a few more than they had mentioned, he estimated that there were 40 this year in 1890. Now this uh, sermon was published verbatim, and he condemned drinking because it led to gambling and other things. In those hell dives, he said, he had seen men waiting to go in with strange women. And he damned the permit, saying that if it is to be sold, let it be sold legally. In other words, he was a little more charismatic than Mr. Andrews was. But you notice that this is the first reference to prostitution in the news that I've mentioned. And uh, it got a reply from a nom de plume, of course, so you wouldn't put your name to this. And this fellow says, strange women in this town are well behaved and do not intrude themselves on the general public. You know, the old hearts of gold uh, uh, of, of the prostitute, according to the movie. Well, I suppose then, that the nadir of the liquor traffic lies in the story of Constable Doyle that I mentioned previously, who laid charges against everybody and his dog in the cloud and then skipped the country. Now, I have a, that's pretty well the way it was when Lethbridge became a town. But I have a couple of interesting little items that uh, I thought you might like to hear. One of them was, in January 1891, an editorial denounced the closing of the breweries and damned the permit system. The editor says that even temperance people would prefer a licensing system. As a matter of fact, when they voted to incorporate the city, they took a side vote on the side to see how many people were in favor 
I think it was about 142 against the permit system and uh, two in favor of it. But it was an open vote, so I guess uh, people voted the way they thought the fellows wanted them to vote. And it was on this basis that he also opposed that vile stuff known as 4%, which is not fit to be drunk anyway. But it is imported from Winnipeg, so that the Winnipeg brewers are making money at the expense of the people of the Northwest Territory. He claimed the trade should be taken out of the hands of the federal government and placed under the authority of the Northwest Council. So tune in next year when I have read up to about 1905, and we'll see how this all comes out. Now let's have organ music and so on. But would you like to know a little more, an uh, interesting item about the strange women? January the 9th, 1891. A man called Lever of Decency wrote a letter. <laughs> and he deplored the fact that prostitutes were allowed to put on dances in Lethbridge. This should be stopped immediately. Lethbridge, he said, possesses the doubtful honor of being the only town in the Dominion where prostitutes are allowed to hold public dances in the very heart of town, at which gathering they make night hideous with their riot and debauchery, plying their nefarious trade under the noses of our much vaunted police force. And then he said, in times of old, people stoned harlots. Of course, he wasn't advocating violence, he said. <laughs> Just throw some rocks at him. Well, uh, I thought you might be interested in that little out of verse there. But in any case, that's uh, liquor as a teetotaler sees it from the safety of 1974.